Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, outer space. Space, space, space. Hope you enjoy. Story number one. Frying pan plus lightning equals boomerang. Written by in Babylon, they wept. Sir Calvin narrowed his eyes. Nobody could see them through the slits in his helmet, of course. But the slits themselves already gave him the appearance of being perpetually suspicious. It was a happy accident that his makeshift mask would just so happen to match his real face. He asked a question. Are ye the head mage, known for terrorizing official wizards? The old man washing a cast iron pan in the stream didn't stop his chore, but he took a deep breath before looking up to the heavens. His expression wasn't pained, but searching, seeking, as if he was truly pleading with the gods for wisdom. Or perhaps his plea was aimed at the cosmos, maybe even a particularly wise bird, such as an owl. Sir Calvin had heard the owls sometimes confer wisdom upon the sages, but he personally had only seen them confer wet pellets of rodent fur upon the ground. Whatever the source, the old man seemed to receive his desire. He shifted his gaze back to the level and looked the knight in the face and spoke in a level, almost serene voice. Are ye the tin can known for wading through the poison oak? So Calvin looked down, momentarily taken aback. Ah, shit. So he was. He spent a few moments contemplating his predicament. The wizard waited patiently for him to start. It was almost more disconcerting than being rushed. Ah, uh, all right, sir. Listen, if you surrender, the old man cut him off with a gesture. I'll be hauled into one of the circles. Then they'll poke me with a stick and get me to dance like a nice, trained human mage. After they get bored of that, they'll spend the next twenty years reading books written by elves, maybe earn my apprenticeship, and die before nine-tenths of my peers even hit puberty. I think I'll pass. The food is decent, but that's about it. Sir Calvin frowned. Your options aren't surrender or stay here. Your options are to surrender or die by my... So Calvin saw the hand gesture just fast enough to mount his tower shield against the sand. He knew how to deflect a lightning bolt, but it was still risky business. If he kept his stand narrow and only touched the leather and wood parts of the grip, he'd be fined. In his mind's eye, he could really imagine the bolt flowing down the face of the shield into the sand, dissipating harmlessly. But no bolt came. Baffled by the pause, he risked a cautious glance around for the far edge of the shield, just in time to see a thrown cast iron pion hit him square in the face. It was remarkably well-timed. Even the warrior's grace, he couldn't help but stumble backwards. If he was really any less talented, he would have fallen flat in his ass. As it was, he was still left reading long enough for the mage to retrieve some kind of makeshift cudgel stave and from his pack. He wasn't entirely sure what it was, but he could remain confident that it wasn't a casting aid. The wood was simple oak, wrapped around and rewrapped hundreds of times with a mixture of iron and copper wire. Not a foci to be seen. It was tempting to spend another second or so to get to his feet more firmly back under him, but he knew better than to play defense. Long range was a wizard's game. He needed to cross the gap there and then. He blitzed. The major's fingers were twisting sigils through the air, but he trusted his shield, trusted it to deflect the lightning away from him. He was braced for, ready. He heard the cackle of lightning discharge through the air, smelled the familiar scent of ozone. Those he recognized. What he didn't recognize were the otherworldly yank he felt across his entire body. For one brief moment, it felt almost as if two or three people had stood behind him and pushed forward, throwing him towards the mage. He was almost grateful for the boost. Then the pan that had already hit him in the face, the same pan that he knew for a fact should be sitting inert in the bushes behind him, collided loudly with the back of his steel helm. Even if it hadn't knocked him unconscious, the blow would have been enough to knock him over. Not many knights could recover their buttons if hit from behind during a sprint. Threat neutralized, the wizard got up and trudged over to the pan, just a few feet away from the fallen knight. He inspected it with a critical eye, wincing at the various dings it had picked up during its fights. Then he rummaged through the knight's belongings. There was a surprisingly full purse. He didn't help himself to the entirety, but he did take enough to buy several new pants. Maybe even a nice set of socks. Winter was coming soon, after all. 
As was his new tradition, he continued his search until he found a few scraps of parchment. Pleased with his prize, he sat down and wrote a short letter using his clean pan as a makeshift desk. Sir Knight, excellent work on the shield planting. Tell Sir Horace that he taught you well. Also tell him they cost you a broken nose. He teaches every polyp astute apprentice to look over the far side of their shield. Claims it helps with their side splashes. It doesn't help with very large iron plans. <laughs> Signed, Tom Bug. P.S. Ask Avalon for a book about electromagnetics. It should be next to the section about suplexing. The wizard dusted off his hands and began to walk away before a minor impulse struck him. Jogging carefully back to the unconscious man, he cast a minor healing incantation before adding a second note to the end of his letter. P.P.S. I've healed your poison oak, as it is a pain that I am sympathetic to. I have left your concussion, though, as I am very unsympathetic, and believe it was a well-earned bitch. Content with his work, he picked up his pan and plodded upstream. If he was lucky, he'd make it to his cave before evening. End of story. Story number two. The Human God, written by The R Guy. I am the head teller of the Yitral Empire. My job is to find civilization's god, then assess whether that civilization is a danger or not. So many civilizations say that they have no god, but I always find a god. These humans, however, are tricky. They look like they have no god in every subject we get. So there is a different answer from no god to hundreds. I was sent to a city on the human's home planet of Terra to try and gauge the god which festers in their psyche. It was tricky, but I got to the god eventually. But, of course, every god holds a place in the psyche of the Cavillation, and the human god lived in a stay barnyard that looked better for an animal than a god. As I entered the hole that I assumed was the entrance, I saw two humans one younger, no older than 35, and an old human, no older than 75. Then I realized I both looked frail and with the older man in a portable chair. The young man was the first to notice me. Father, we have a visitor, he said. Who are you? You are not one of my children, the older man cried. Who are you? I said calmly. Yahweh. Father of humanity, Yahweh says. Yahweh, are you God of humanity? I say, still calm. God, I am not God, just a housekeeper, Yahweh says, confused. But you created humanity, didn't you? I say, annoyed. I am a housekeeper. My job is to watch over the humans, Yahweh explains. So if you, not a God, you must be the human's God, I say, pointing at the young man. Yahweh begins to laugh at this comment, cackling to himself. What's so funny, old man? If you're not God, you can die, say Furious. No, he makes sure of that. After this comment, I begin to choke. Who's he? Yahweh begins to laugh, so I choke him harder, slamming his head against the clay wall of the barn. This only seems to make him laugh more after ten minutes of me choking him harder and harder. Yahweh finally stops laughing and lays on the ground, you're lying, you are a god, and you are weak, so humanity is weak. Yahweh lied there, panting like a dog for a second. Then I began to call my bosses to tell them what I found before Yahweh slowly sat up stone-faced and pointed over my shoulder. You want to meet God, Yahweh says, smirking. I looked over my shoulder to see what he was pointing at and jumped. The figure standing in the door was at least eight feet cloaked in a full-body robe with only bony fingers handling a human farming tool. It walked up to me slowly, quietly. I tried to back away from it, but I froze. It froze me in place. It knelt to me so that I could see under its cloak. There, I should have been a face of emptiness. Then I saw why the humans worshipped this thing. It was horrible what the humans did in favor and servitude to this thing. They destroyed themselves to feel its cold embrace. Why 
Would the human serve such a terrible god as this one? He gave me my answer. They tried, but gave up upon realizing it was impossible. The entity finally showed its name. Death! Then death led me to the doorway, and that's when I saw it. The barn was just smoke and mirrors. The natural home of a god lay around the barn. In tens of billions of graves, each human, humans, were being guided into open graves. Dead, let down the hill on which the barn stood open. It led me down to an open grave with my name on it. No, 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 I screamed. I called to my commanders. Do not antagonize the human. They are dangerous, I repeat. Do not antagonize the humans. They are dangerous. Before death pushed me into the open pit, I woke up in the position where I began the session. But something didn't feel right. I stood up and tried to open the door, but the handle went right through me. I turned around to see my limp body lying on the floor. I was dead. End of story. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons and channel members. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, it's difficult to pronounce, Lord Arishakal, Dragzoon, WRE, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.